This is uh, the new session of Ask Alex. Today, we got a special guest, Kirk Pulling. He's going to be doing an overview on our Pro Concrete uh, tools in Open Bridge Designer, plus more. So, giving pass to Chris and making you a presenter. Alrighty. Uh, and just so, as Alex said, my name's Kirk Pullen. I specialize with uh, the Pro Structures application and more specifically uh, the Pro Concrete side of the program, modeling reinforcement inside of concrete elements and then creating drawings and uh, reports and everything you need for deliverables from that. Uh, so I have a lot of experience. Uh, I've been, I used Pro Structures or Pro Concrete in my previous employment uh, to actually work on live projects and model reinforcement, create drawings and actually ship uh, rebar, you know, to the job site, go through fabrication and everything like that, all from Pro Concrete. Uh, so I have a lot of you know, real world experience on that front. But uh, what I've done here, and just to clarify one other thing that um, Alex was saying is that uh, we were gonna focus specifically on some of the drawing creation reports and annotations and stuff like that within this call, uh, just to kind of give a quick overview. Uh, of course, there is a lot, of, a lot to be covered or a lot that can be covered, but we don't have all that much time. So we'll be quick with our overview, uh, but I'm going to be doing it entirely within Pro Concrete. And the reason being is that currently uh, you need to have a Pro Concrete license in order to have access to these tools. So originally uh, there was a whole you know collection of Pro Concrete tools that were incorporated into OpenBridge, uh, sort mm -hmm. of free of charge. But then the the qualifying you know thing was like, okay, if you want to be able to create your drawings and deliverables and reports and schedules and all that stuff. Uh, so more of that meat of the reinforcing, uh, then you're going to need to actually have that Pro Concrete license. And currently, you'd need to be within Pro Structures in order to activate that license or have the program realize that. But in the future, you'll be able to activate your Pro Concrete license from inside of OBM, so you're not having to switch between applications just to move forward in your workflow. But um, me personally, I, I think from a just a workflow standpoint, because I do get this question a lot from bridge users, is, there? is that um, what I would prefer users do is create your bridge model just as your solids model. And then if you want to model reinforcement, create an additional just blank model and then reference your bridge into that model and model your reinforcement in there. And it'll help to kind of compartmentalize your models a little bit and you know prevent a whole lot of data from showing up in just a single model and bogging down performance and stuff like that but mm -hmm. it also allows for multiple users to be working on the same project at the same time referencing in that same concrete model so you know if i'm working on the the end here and my colleague is on the right and we're going to meet in the middle uh, we can both be using that same concrete model referenced in. And then if we need to, we can reference each other's models in to kind of see where we're at and compare and contrast or whatever. But um, so right now I have a OBM bridge referenced in and I've modeled some reinforcement throughout it just enough to uh, create some drawings with at least and some reports. So once I'm ready inside of Pro Concrete, I would just line my view up. Uh, however, I want to obtain this drawing. So I always recommend to obtain like a overall or sort of plan view first. So I'm just going to rotate with three points there. That way I can disregard the skew that's applied to the bridge. And then what I've done, I've already placed a, uh, a plan view here, but I actually just use the section tool for everything because really it's just the orientation that matters. So I'm going to choose my drawing seed, which can be customized match your organization standards. And then I'm just going to pick my left side, basically the view extents. So, you know, how wide do I want this view to be? And I pick my right side. I could have done it in the opposite direction. There's really no requirement there. And then I would define my view depth. But before I do that, and since I've already got two placed, I'm not actually going to place that one just yet. What I would always recommend doing before you create drawings, unless you want the rebar, the actual 3D bars to show up in that drawing, is at the time of creating the drawing, turn all your reinforcement off. All you want to be visible is just concrete, just your outlines that you want to show up on the drawing, right? So I'm going to go ahead and go through this process again, choose, make sure my drawing seat is set, and then I'll go ahead and place this one here, going from the left to the right, just basically making sure I get the entirety of this structure you know, closed in there. 
then I'll get my create drawing dialog. I can define a name for it. So it's a uh, plan uh, one. And choose to create a sheet model if I'd like. Of course, I need a drawing model at least. This is where I'm going to place all my annotations and uh, call out my bars and whatnot. So definitely need that drawing model. The sheet model is optional in the case that you already have a sheet and you're going to reference this onto that sheet. You could actually choose the sheet here if you wanted it to be automatically referenced if that sheet already existed. Uh, but I already have a sheet, so I'm just going to turn it off for now just to walk through the drawing creation process. So once I hit OK, it's going to take me to the drawing model since I didn't create a sheet model. And it's going to do a little bit of work in the background, placing all of the resymbolized bars. So the moment I get into this drawing model, and it would have looked the same if it were on a sheet model, with the exception for the background being white. Uh, but you can see there's all these additional elements, line elements, kind of range looking uh, elements that have been placed automatically by pro structures or pro concrete uh, for us to annotate all of these bars with. So if I wanted to uh, maybe use this for my deck plan to place my annotations for my longitudinal and transverse bars, I could, I could do that. But maybe at this point in time, I'm really only focused. I want to do an elevation view of that interior structure there. So uh, what I'm going to do is I can just disregard all of the levels that were generated here. These are all assigned to those re-symbolized elements that ProConcrete generates. And you may notice that it is generating additional levels just with an appended uh, mm -hmm. piece of text there. And what that allows us to do is if we go through the trouble of actually assigning our levels inside of the model uh, properly, then it makes it significantly easier to come through here and quickly differentiate between what you want to show or what you want to annotate and what you don't want to an annotate. So here you can see just with turning levels off, I was able to uh, filter down just to my slab reinforcement. And now I can continue adjusting that. Now, one other thing I notice is that since I've already created the drawing, uh, or when I was creating the drawing rather, I selected the, or I had the opportunity to select my drawing scale for this detail. Uh, and I think I left it ha set at half inch equals a foot, which is the default for that drawing seed. So if I realize now that maybe that's a bit too large and I need to increase that scale maybe to like eighth inch equals a foot, I can do that through this drawing production tab. Or if I just come up to the search or then let's see drawing scale, it would take me to it. It's going to be a group. So it is available within the standard drawing tools on the utilities tab. It's nothing new. It's just that annotation scale modifier there, but uh, it's also on the concrete tab within that drawing production. So if I change this to eighth inch equals a foot, you'll notice there's a hiccup here where it's processing. And now if any bar is updated, let me go ahead and place some text here. So to actually place a call out for a set of reinforcement, let's say we wanted to call out these transverse bars here. I can come in with my modify rebar tool. I'll identify the bar that I want to manipulate. And then left click, you can see that just updated there. Uh, another way to update would be through the rebar attributes. I can cover that in just a moment. But now I can set up my preset or my call out. I can select a preset, which uh, just is going to automatically populate one of the fields we see here with text. Now inside of this field, you can see there are some like dollar sign and then characters. Those are macros, and if I go down to the very bottom in my preset list here, there's a help option that actually opens up a preview window for that presets file. So you can customize the preset file to make sure that only your standard callout formats are available in here, um, or you could always just come in and manually adjust any of these after the fact and type in any you know, uh, typical or any kind of additional text you need to define in there, you're more than welcome to add. So I can also come through and scroll through this preview window to see the other uh, available macros that I can insert into here too. So if you needed to include the bar grade or maybe the shape into the text, you could definitely do that. Um, but let's say I just want to say we have a quantity, uh, the bar size with the unique to the imperial unit system, the, the pound sign in front, uh, and then an X for by, but actually I'm just going to change that to a hyphen. And then our KL here is the bar mark or bar length. So if a bar mark exists, it will use that instead. And then I'm going to say at 
dollar sign NS for nominal spacing. I can have some additional options here on like the terminator. Let's say I want a small circle locked to the origin, which means it's just going to automatically snap right there to that point, and I can come and place my call out. And accept. There we go. So now if that's still a little too small, let's say I wanted to increase this to 1 16th. You can see everything sort of updates there. I can also use that rebar attributes to update any of the default settings that might have been applied to these bars. Let me go ahead and run that. There we go. And then a lot of those settings that are defined, so your color, the text style that's being used, anything of that nature is going to be set up within our rebar defaults here uh, for the Pro Structures tool. So we can customize uh, the level of the, or the text that is appended. If I go to my level display, you can see level 9 corresponds to the default layer selected here. And then on the miscellaneous tab here, we have the default for the annotation as level 37. And you can see that's why it's choosing level 37 there. So in various you know workspace customizations, I've set it up so that you know the, the bar is on RB detail or you know the callout is on Anno or something like that, but it still corresponds to the actual uh, text or um, the uh, 3D bar level. All right. So once we have one of these elements placed, and I can check my text settings here just to make sure that everything looks right. Textile for 1.8. Let me date from the library. There we go. That looks better. Somehow it got off of 1.8 inch. And let's say I wanted to just utilize this exact same callout for, really, I could probably use it for all of these. So once I have one placed, if I'm happy with that uh, format, I can use the quick edit tool to copy my bar label. It's the last option in our quick edit. And I can just come in, select the bar label I want to copy, and then choose locations I want to copy it to. Now, in the case of maybe this rotated one, if I wanted to come through and uh, modify that to change its orientation, let's say I do modify rebar, and we'll place it vertically instead, and accept that, and then work off of that as the bar label that I'm going to copy to maintain that sort of orientation. And then uh, for the other instances that, you know, I can adjust these after the fact just using a click and drag. So here this call out might be, you know, getting in the way of the one that we've placed just below. So if I just wanted to use move, move it up, I could do that. If I move it far enough past origin, it should shift sides. Seems like it's going to give me some trouble here. It's not a problem, though. I can just come in and replace it and then hit my check mark to accept. Now, we do have a lot of additional options on how this callout is displayed if it's pointing to a bar that is associated to a range. Uh, so for that, I'm going to go into my modify rebar. I'll select the callout there to edit. Um, but what I'm going to do is actually adjust my range display. So one of the options here, and this, this display is going to be unique to the, um, the re most recent update of ProStructure. So uh, it has been made available on the softwaredownloads.bentley.com website. It's update 5.2. Uh, but if any of you are or have any familiarity with the uh, detail creation or placement process, you may notice that this interface is a bit different. Um, they've incorporated this bottom tab down here, or the it used to be a separate floating toolbar, but now it is just incorporated into the dialog itself. So if I want to modify the range display, I can choose the modify bar limits icon to open up that dialog. And then we do have some options if you want to detail all bars, which in this case might be a bit much. Uh, if we want to hide the delimiter line, if we want a dual, which would just uh, also require us to have the external dual bar delimiter turned on. So that's just going to modify the manner in which it's presented. You know, are we showing just a single bar in the middle of the range or along the range? We can adjust the location of this bar using the offset icons here. I can also use an internal version of this bar if I'd like. And 
and I can flip the side that it is displayed on using the modifiers here as well as shift it away to away from or closer to the element. So let me go ahead and just switch that up and we'll come back to the text and just place that above. Now I'm using a leader line here but let's say I wanted to use a line label instead. So there are three different types that we can use here for our delimiters and this is just going to allow me to place it right on that line. Now if I had text with a background enabled uh, it would cut that line for me visually. Uh, otherwise I could choose the position option here to switch it to be between and then if I had some text below let's say it would show up below. So if I had above everything is going to be above low and then centered is basically the same thing as between. All right. And just as with the leader line callouts, we can drag and relocate this piece of text if we need to. And then the last callout format that we have there is the delimiter line label. It's just going to tie it right onto the end of that delimiter. Uh, and the delimiter line is just that range line indicator, sort of a dimension looking indicator there. The geometry of it, the arrow geometry at the end, all of that can be customized for an organization to match your standards. Uh, so nothing to worry about there. Check mark to accept. All right, I think I might have hit a shortcut on my keyboard. Give me just a moment. I have a, uh, a button on my keyboard that shortcuts to uh, the element selection tool and if you go to element selection without saving it has some trouble with it so let me just do this real quick. Get another instance running. back in. So once we've got that drawing set up, now as I was saying in the beginning, uh, I always prefer or recommend that users take that overall view just because I, I feel that, I mean, everybody is more comfortable in 2D whenever you don't have to worry about that depth or if you're snapping to something on the wrong plane or something like that. Uh, once we get into 2D, everything is significantly uh, more foolproof, so to speak. And, and a lot of the times the placement of maybe uh, additional section cuts that you want to uh, show on your drawings or something of that nature, uh, that's going to be dependent upon how it looks inside of the drawing. So where we were at, let's see, I'm going to go to my plan here. And fit view, there we go. And let me turn those levels on our bridge. All right, so here we are. And I'm just going to turn off all of the enforcement. There we go. Okay, so let's say that we did want to demonstrate or detail these uh, slab bars on this view, but also we want of course an elevation view of that interior structure. So being in 2D, of course we could always go out into 3D and place it just like we did for our plan view, but you know, why make it harder? I'm just going to go ahead and activate my section callout tool, make sure my drawing seed is selected, and then place my section cut in here. And the uh, the detailing symbols here, those end bubbles can be customized to match standards and text heights. Uh, I see that this one's coming in with a, seems an incorrect text height, but not a problem. So let's just say, uh, All right, go ahead and open this, and this will allow us to relatively quickly generate that elevation view for that structure. And it could have been at a skew in that view as well. Uh, so we now see that there are some callouts being automatically placed. This is due to a workspace uh, customizable setting 
or DGN lib that a user or an organization can set up to match their standards. But uh, what we can do inside of that file is go through and there is one of every element modeled. Basically, there's rebar, there's a rebar cage, a column cage, slab reinforcement, wall reinforcement, footing, continuous footing. And we can go through and place callouts that match our standards uh, on those elements and, you know, orient them in the way that we typically orient them. And then if we have that set up, anytime we create a drawing and an element of that type is encountered, uh, the callout that has been defined in that file will be placed and it'll attempt to place it at as best as it can in the same sort of orientation and uh, angle and distance from, you know, the termination point as possible. Let's see there. I can actually move these pretty easy now with the drag and drop just dragging that leader line if I need to relocate it and then dragging the text if I need to move that. And I can always use those as a source uh, for, let's say, annotating any other bars that I might need to annotate in here. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and we'll say we need maybe a couple more sections in here. We'll do one through uh, the beam at the top here. So let's go from here to there a little bit of that and we don't actually have to navigate to that drawing whenever we create it there is this checkbox down here at the bottom for open model if i turn that off i can just keep working placing additional views in the case that i have more than one view here and let me update my attributes to get rid of those brown bars they must be defined as uh, that color within that uh, default labels dg and lib file so i've got my beam section let's say we need one through this beam down at the bottom here so place another section let's say right now let me avoid the other annotations and An additional one here. Now I can open up this model. And I created a sheet at the same time, so that was on accident. Just toggling that off. But there's no harm or foul in accidentally creating a sheet. If that happened on accident, I could just navigate back to that drawing model, open up my models dialog, and remove that beam section sheet, footing section sheet. It looks like I did it for both of them. And then I can continue working on annotating these elements. So here we do have some longitudinal bars, and they are showing up as uh, circles. So no matter whether a, a bar is actually a longitudinal bar in practice, uh, or you know how you would refer to it professionally as a longitudinal bar, what purpose it's serving, um, whenever it comes to the drawing creation process, a longitudinal bar is a bar that is being drawn as a circle, no matter what. So that being said, the settings that are defined for longitudinal bars apply to that. So we see that we have the filled circles option enabled here, but they're showing up as empty. That's because of our display style. We would need to use a filled uh, hidden line display style in order to accomplish that. Let me go ahead and activate that. There we go. Wireframe, they'll just be see-through. But now we can continue uh, working. So one of the new additions and probably a very popular addition to update 5.2, and it's going to be a technology preview, uh, is the fudge rebar tool. And this will allow us to, in cases like we have here, uh, adjust the actual presentation of these bars to make it a little bit clearer on the geometry and layout of the ties that we have going on inside of this beam or the stirrups rather. So I can shift out these legs, uh, moving them away from where they actually are in the 3D model, just with the understanding that it's being done for clarity. So I can come down to the bottom here and get that inside one. And let's say uh, the outside one. There we go. So I can pull those lines away from each other a little bit, make that a little bit clearer um, to the field and anybody reviewing it as well. And then I can come through and place my call out. So the process for annotating longitudinal bars is pretty much the same. There is some different options for uh, placing our call outs here. You can see that the 
label dialog looks a little bit different with our label types up here. Uh, but we can place our typical arrow label. And let's say we want, you know, at the very least, we could do a single leader. Let's say we just wanted to call out the bar mark. Oh, I'm going to come in. Let me say arrow filled so I can have one there. Um, the circle is currently coming in as filled, but we can set up a display rule to handle that um, because of the filled hidden line. In the case that we had a wireframe display here, back to wireframe just for a second. Let me modify that bar again and use our large circle. There's uh, some pretty cool options that we have on how it's handling this annotation. So right now we just have a single leader. Uh, we could do first and last. So it's actually seeing all of these to be 11A1s. Um, or we can say all, in which case we get them all. Now, because we have two layers here, it's going to act probably a little bit different. But if I'm careful with how I pull that across, I can actually get it to automatically format those uh, leader lines so that they're all at the same angle. And I just need to be outside of that rightmost or leftmost um, bar in order to accomplish that sort of presentation there. And then I can place maybe a call out for my ties here. Let's say I'm just going to place one. And I can quick edit and copy that to the others. Just them afterwards, it looks like the angle lock got turned on. Angle lock will prevent you from uh, pulling in any direction other than 90 or 0. So, right there. Uh. And I can come up, let's say, well, let's say for this one, I need to just go this way. Be careful whenever you right click there, it'll rotate on you. And I just did it again. A habit of mine hitting the. Uh, Element selection tool. Need to remove that button. So once we have all of those sections generated, uh, all we need to do is just orient them or uh, place them onto our sheet. And making some adjustments if needed. So I'm going to go to my sheet now. that a second to process. Anytime we access the model or navigate between views, it's always checking and making sure that uh, everything is up to date or any rebar adjustments that have been made in the model are reflected on the drawing. So here we have the original overall plan uh, that I generated. It looks like some additional bars are being sh are showing there. So I can go ahead and turn those off if I don't want anything detailed in this view. Let's see there. Or I can just use the other drawing that I did detail. So let me go ahead and just detach that. And we'll start from scratch here. So I'm going to go to my Explorer. Uh, the Explorer dialog is available through most of the tabs, but um, it is the icon shown here within the common tools. The very bottom, we'll see our models. We can see all those models we generated. And then I can just drag and drop from there, hit OK, and I'll get a preview of the size of this detail from the drawing boundary. It may actually be a little bit smaller than that in the end, as we can see here. I'll need to make sure that I make the same level adjustments here that I made inside of that. Since I didn't actually hide the bars, there is a process that you can use to hide them uh, programmatically as opposed to just turning that level off. And I can adjust the drawing title there. I can rename it. Of course, right now it is just pulling the uh, drawing name. But let's say if I wanted to you know, have a different in there, I can I can manually do that. Uh, again, by default, the drawing title bubble here is going to be pulling from the model information. So if I wanted to go to my properties for the model, go to my models dialog properties, I can change my name here. So let's say we just wanted this to be S1, and then I will also need to change the sheet number. So as soon as I did that, you can see it updated out here. The, the lower half of this drawing title 
uh, is going to display the current annotation scale that is being applied to the detail. Uh, if I highlight that drawing title, I can actually go to the properties dialog and adjust that scale if necessary through the option here. So this allows us all of the you know, predefined scale options there. And we can also just you know, do a reference scale. So just scaling the reference after which this uh, value would update to match the scale defined or the resulting scale of the reference. So I'm just going to shift this. Let me move that a little bit up say right there and make room for the other items I want to include. So next one, let's say I wanted that elevation. There's the interior elevation, drag and drop that in. And it looks like it might be a little large, but let's just click a spot for it. Yep, quite large. Now let's say that we actually did want this scale, uh, but we of course don't need to show all of those peers, right? We only need about foot from the top, a foot from the bottom, everybody can pretty much infer what's going on in between there. Uh, so what we could do in this scenario is utilize a, it's kind of a standard microstation tools, there's nothing special to it, but uh, what I like doing is having a no plot level defined, like in this case clip shape. And I'm just going to come through and I could use either, you know, place box or if I just wanted to manually place a smart line around the extents of what I want to show in the first view here. And I can create a copy of this just so I don't have to do it again for the lower half and adjust it. All right, so now I'm going to create mm. clip volume. So interior elevation, clip boundary. I'm just going to identify that clip shape and it's going to cut it off there. And there's actually probably a, a even quicker way of doing that. If I make a copy of this reference right now, that clip shape is going to be maintained or that clip boundary will be maintained. And I can just adjust it uh, to change that you know, view depth. But I could also just come in and let's say I could reference it again or like I was saying a moment ago, copy. So if I copy this just up to there, and then move this down. Pull that back. Let me get rid of that one there. Now I just need to shift it up until I can see the bottom. Move reference. Got the wrong one there. Thank God. Pull Z there. Careful whenever you are moving reference through the right click option that uh, the use reference dialog list is disabled if you're selecting something from the view uh, unless you're actually right clicking on it in the list here as i just did a moment ago you can see there's a potential for accidental misclick and we also want to make sure that we don't move the reference boundary so i'm hitting all of the things to not do there <laughs> it's going to keep moving it up until i see the bottom there's the bottom all right, so now we have our you know, separation between there and there, and we can come through with maybe some break line elements, or um, I actually have a, wrote a little tool that can place a break line element pretty quick with the defined options. Um, just an add-on tool that I personally created, but I mean, a lot of organizations have their own break line elements. And now if I switch away from that level, I can come in and turn off that clip shape just to kind of get a preview. Looks like I placed those break okay. lines on that level. And see the result. So useful. And then all I need to do now is place some of the other sections. So let's say our footing section, we annotated that one a bit. And we also need to maybe identify where these sections are being taken at. So I can come up here and you may notice these little markers that are showing up. They kind of look like a circle with, uh, it looks like a golf ball that's cut in half in the middle maybe. 
and I can see which drawing these markers are associated to. So each one of them does, you know, correspond to a drawing. And if I want to at this time, I can enable those callouts. So the moment I turn that on, callouts will appear. I can adjust the end handles for these if I need to. Again, the textile that's being applied to them is pulling from the uh, the detailing symbol DGN lib, so it can be completely customized. Let's say I just want to make it 3 8 or 1 8 inch. Also, adjust it this way. There we go. There we go. And that drawing number is going to correspond with the number associated to that view. So you see interior elevation currently is two and for our section callout symbol there, it's gonna show up automatically as two. And furthermore, because of that connection, um, it actually knows where that drawing's placed at because if you, I highlight this drawing title, you can see the little box boundary sort of element that shows up. Uh, it's an invisible element, but if I make sure that this matches the area there, whenever I print this, it's actually gonna create a hyperlink between the elements. So I'll be able to come in and left click, it'll show up like I'll get the little, you know, hand cursor element there inside of my PDF viewer. If I click on it, it will just automatically take me in and fit screen on that corresponding section. And then I can also come in and let's say I need to enable that one. We'll adjust its text so it matches. And then if I wanted to place the uh, top one as well, I could do that. So I can continue adjusting these, moving them around, but let's say we need to place the schedule in here. So to show some bending information or maybe just material information, I can definitely do that utilizing my schedule generator tool. So uh, one of the additional functionalities of the schedule generator tool, or it's kind of there are two tools in one, the manual marking tool is incorporated or, you know, is delivered with the schedule generator tool. And the manual marking tool is available for use inside of OpenBridge Modeler. So this allows you just the ability to uh, apply a user-defined item type to a set of reinforcement or to rebar that will be utilized as the bar mark instead of the system-defined bar mark. So whenever you go through the process of positioning your bars, which I'll just run through real quick, we have to set up a, a bar mark format and an alpha code. And typically with bridge structures, your you know your footings will have a different letter than your bridge beams or your piers or your deck, and you know it'll change throughout the structure. Or maybe there's just completely irregular marking altogether uh, that you for whatever reason can't accomplish with the uh, the bar mark options we have here. Uh, you can continue and just go through the process, set up your bar mark as you know as closely as you can to what your output would want to you'd want it to be, and get the bar marks applied. And then using the manual bar mark tool, we can override that system defined bar mark with a user mark. So I'm just going to load them up into my bar mark manager here. And once they finish loading, I can see the results. I can see the concrete element that they're associated to. And this is based off of the grouping that I have find at the top here. So if I just wanted to see a continuous list of all the bars, I could disable that grouping and scroll through and view them. But of course you want to, you know, maybe we want to use an A for the abutments, but we want to use a B for the beam. So this just makes it easier to do a click and drag if they're grouped by that concrete element. And it's based off the concrete element you selected whenever you modeled those bars. So I can come in and right click on this selection. And let's say I just wanted to replace these, uh, the 11A2 with a B instead. So I just wanna switch the, the A out for a B here. I can hit accept. It's just gonna do like a find replace on those, switch them to a B. And let's say for the deck, I want these to be maybe an S or a D. Uh, but in this scenario, let's say I wanna mark them sequentially. So completely, uh, disregarding any sequential numbering that has been assigned thus far. I can start over from scratch because this is a user-defined mark. It 
doesn't have to be unique. I mean, you know, it's kind of, you know, user beware. You're taking it upon yourself that, you know, what you're defining for this bar is going to be unique enough and how you're going to annotate it on the drawing is going to be clear enough that the guy in the field is going to understand it. Uh, so let's say I wanted to remark these with the alpha continuous numbering. And let's say this one's going to be uh, S and we're going to start at five instead. So it's just going to step from five and up. And then I also have the option. So here we have some peer reinforcement. P1, P2, P3. And let's say each one of them needs to restart from one and use a P. So I can do that as well. I can do mark sequentially with alpha continuous numbering. Actually, let me hit that selection again. Should be a, sorry, my right click menu is, yeah, the rest, I'm not sure why that's not enabling. I'll have to look into that, but let me just try this instead. We could always just do subsets restarting each time, but so whenever I have a selection that contains multiple different uh, concrete elements, and it may actually be looking at these as an individual there. Let me check. Um, but it should enable that restart for each concrete element. Let's see, it might have just been that. Yeah, there we go. So with the options enabled here now, the second option I have is to group matching concrete by reinforcement. So what it's actually going to do is look at each concrete element. Uh, figure out all the reinforcement that you've selected for those concrete elements and then compare them between each other and figure out if there's any identical uh, elements in there. So in the case that they're not, it separates them out. In the case that there are, this concrete quantity would be two or three instead, and then it would just provide us the qu uh, number of bars and information for an individual. So let's say I did this again with restart. There we go. So we can see it started at one and then started over at one there. All right. And then whenever I'm ready, I can just hit apply and load to schedules. This is only available if you're inside of pro structures. So it's going to run through, apply all of these item types that I've defined to those bars, open up my schedule generator and send the selection over to it. So now I can see basically what I would have seen if I would have opened the schedule generator and loaded everything in. Only now my manual marks are being shown in place of the bar marks where defined. Um, so now with this, the first tab here is just a very sort of vanilla uh, bending schedule that you can place. Uh, it just matches something that is pretty typical, I think, in the rebar fabrication world or would make sense to pretty much anyone uh, once we navigate to our sheet here so I can place this I can demonstrate that and also I guess at this time I can say that I can also select these bars from the sheet so if I turn on the 3d element uh, within the reference view in question I can select those 3d bars and uh, load them in so I'm not having to switch between the 3d model and that sheet in the case that navigating to the sheet takes an irregularly long amount of time. So let's see what I get here. I'm just going to hit place schedule, give it a second to think about all the data. And I've clicked to choose a location to place it at. Now, the format of the schedule, the text style, um, the height and width of these rows is all defined on the options tab or can be controlled and customized on the options tab. So uh, we have a column width and height defined here. The, the values you're seeing are going to be defined off of the, uh, the design file working units or the, for the active model. So if I accept this, you see from the file working units, we want to show feet and inches and we'll use a fractional there. So now we can see our column width is 15 16 I guess. 3 16 on the row height. I'm not sure where that automatically populated from. This may have been an old template that I have. But most of the settings that I have defined here, and really any setting you see here, can be controlled from a template file. So 
clearly there's a lot of options that you can toggle on and off and you know we don't want you doing that every single time so if you get into the schedule generator and set up all your options we have some additional columns that can be displayed within that bin schedule uh, we have some additional you know, leg options so you can see here um, there may be some columns that we have no lengths provided for just one it looks like unfortunately so uh, this last R column here, maybe we don't need it to show up on the uh, the sheet. If we want to save some space, we can turn off the or turn on the exclude empty bend leg columns from place table. Come back over and update. It should just remove out that R and replace our table. So now it's just going to end at O, right? And let's say we wanted a more specific schedule here, maybe of the uh, peer column. So or that footing there. So let's say we wanted just a material schedule for the footing. I'm gonna clear out my selection and just to demonstrate, as I was talking about earlier, find that 3D bar level, turn it on. There we are, select them and load. There we go. So there's the contents of that footing. I can come over and uh, let's say I don't need a bin schedule for this one. Um, I just to give you a demonstration. It's probably going to be a lot smaller, easier to display than that one I put on the other side, but um, maybe I want to set up a custom schedule. So I already have one currently defined. Um, by default, you this tab would probably have zero columns on it. It's meant to be empty at first, and then for the user to set it up, I can choose all of the options within this combo box here for columns to add. So if I wanted to add an additional column, uh, let's say surface. Uh, what you would do is you would select that item you want to add or the, the data column you want to incorporate and then hit the add column and it would show up on the end there. Now you can see it will show up the first two rows of this dialogue or this table specifically are always blank and that's for you to be able to customize or override your own header information as opposed to the bending schedule that just automatically populates that header information we have the ability to control the header here. So let's say surface. And then all of this information is saved to that template as well. So you're not having to type this back in over and over again. Now I do have some additional grouping being applied. So you can see I have the group by concrete owner in the custom table enabled and the combined by matching reinforcement count matching concrete. This is allowing me to you know, differentiate between matching or you know, different elements in the case of maybe my peer columns that have some similarity might be able to be named the same you know, concrete name and display just in an individual column with a quantity of two for the concrete. I, you know, that's always a possibility. But uh, with this layout, and because these are all associated to the same concrete element, there is some additional kind of appearance work that is applied to that output schedule as you can see here uh, any repeated value in that header is going to end up being a merged cell so let me go and adjust my width here actually define it as a minimum table there we go a little bit better and I'm also getting my subtotal for this, you know, that's going to be dependent upon your unit system, either pounds or kilograms. Um, and then I also have some additional grouping in here. So you can see the uh, zone and spacing information is automatically being pulled from the beam itself. Uh, the Z1, Z2, and Z3 correspond to the zone information I defined for that uh, those stirrups inside of the beam reinforcing tool because I used the beam tool to model that reinforcement. And for those stirrup zones, I defined that text as such. Uh, but in the case of like a wall or something of that nature, um, it will be able to automatically differentiate, you know, near face or horizontal or vertical in the case that you want to utilize the zone information. Uh, but for beams and columns, you actually have the ability to control that and customize it to match whatever you define inside of the reinforcement dialog, as well as the label too. So you can see the rebar label here, and we can actually sort by the label or the zone, those two 
uh, columns are unique in that nature and we can reorder these as well so i can click and drag and drop i can do that same thing on the bin schedule tab in the case that i want to move a, a column anywhere else in the schedule if i have let's say i live in a region where maybe the letter u is always used for a bin leg dimension and it's not here and i have a shape in the model that has a u in it i can right click on the bin schedule tab or actually Right click and add individual leg to table. Sorry, it was at the bottom. I was looking for it at the top there. Add individual bin leg to table. And give that leg a name. It'll show up on the end and then I can you know, place it wherever I want. And if I save my template at this point, then that will also be incorporated into that default or that standard. So I'm not having to worry about doing that in the future. <clears throat> If there's anything that is required, so this bin number leg here <clears throat> is uh, utilized anytime you have like an A1 or a B1 leg, basically there would be an additional line. We would see the number one, and then in that corresponding column, uh, that leg would be that leg value would be displayed. But if we wanted it to be excluded from our place table, you can see that pound sign there. Let me just go ahead and place a new table right here. I can right click on the column in question and click the exclude. And just to make sure I can right click again and you can see it turns to include now. And if I update, it'll actually remove it from being placed. So that as well is saved as part of your um, template. So any column you've manually chosen to exclude will be retained. And then you can also set that up to be your default template so that anytime you're restarting the application or restarting the tool, it's automatically selected and loaded. Because, you know, maybe you need, you have one definition for a beam schedule, and then maybe you have a different material schedule that is set up. So you could go in and load up that template and, you know, get a completely different output uh, real quick and then place that schedule, you know, if you wanted maybe a summary or something of that nature. Uh, but we also have the ability to place summary tables. So if we, can, if we have a, a big selection of different concrete elements, it would break out by that if we wanted to, or if we wanted to just do it by bar size, we could do that as well. And that would just be based off of the selection that we've currently made. So that is the, well, there's probably more that I could cover within the schedule generator tool, and I haven't even gotten the chance to get to the uh, the part list generator tool. But um, basically, the difference between the schedule generator and the part list is the part list is intended or you know really works best for generating external PDF reports. Um, 